I'll just give senators a moment to leave the chamber before we move to the matter of urgency. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 23 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Waters proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, Acting Chair. Uh, war is never the answer. Um, Let me... uh, Senator Steelejohn, you do need to move the motion oh, as well. I apologise. I, uh, I move that the following is a matter of public urgency. Uh, Thank you, Senator Stevens. And that uh, the matter of public urgency being, uh, do I need to read the? Yes, that. that uh, Senator Stevens, you don't need to read it all out. I don't need to read it. You just need to move it. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, as I was saying, uh, war is never the answer. Uh, given the multitudes of conflicts in which we have engaged as a nation, uh, those that have been lost, those that have been marked uh, by their involvement in conflict, uh, the communities that have been destroyed uh, by pointless acts of violence, uh, it would be uh, understandable for many in our community to believe that the simple statement that war is not the answer that it is never the answer it would be a reasonably uncontroversial thing to say. But in this place, in this place, it is still a statement that is considered radical. Even in the aftermath of the illegal invasion of Iraq and the terribly misguided humanitarian intervention into Afghanistan, uh, conflicts into which Australia entered itself at the behest of the United States and which collectively constituted uh, wars uh, that took up most of the first 20 years of this new century, even after the lies of the Bush administration, the complicity of the Howard government, even after the terrible crimes uh, that are now uh, on the record as having been committed in Afghanistan by our special forces. The statement uh, that war must never be the answer is still one to which the major parties refute. And I'm sure in the course of this debate uh, there will be many spurious propositions uh, made by those representing the major parties. During the course of this debate, which I have brought on in this place, uh, directly as a result of the refusal of the major parties yesterday to take the simple common decency step of acknowledging the victims of Australian war crimes in Afghanistan and committing ourselves, having apologised for a compensation scheme. In the aftermath of that disgraceful decision today, uh, it is obviously so needed for this place to fully understand how we came to be here today and what needs to be done to ensure that these crimes are never committed again and to ensure that we never again deploy our forces overseas into a conflict zone. We ask people to put their lives on the line while nobody in this parliament is willing to take political responsibility for that decision. Not one MP is willing to create a process in which we vote to make that happen. First of all, it is so important, as I said, to understand how we came to be here today at this moment when uh, these horrific war crimes have been revealed to our community. 
Uh, it began, uh, in my opinion, uh, with the illegal invasions of Iraq and the misguided invasion of Afghanistan, two conflicts which we entered into at the behest of the United States on a false premise, on an illegal premise, on a lie of WMDs, and in the case of, the Afghan in the case of Afghanistan, following along behind the Americans once again into a war of regime change. Once there, there was no clear strategic direction established, and yet administration after administration, Labour and Liberal, approved the continuation of our presence in this country, in that country. Administration after administration ignored the warnings from many returning veterans that the length of deployment, that what was being asked of serving personnel was too much and that the job they had been given to do was not something that they were trained to do nor capable of doing. And yet, government, Labour and Liberal alike were happy to sign up once again and again and again to maintain our presence there, to keep the Americans happy. And that is why, as we talk about uh, the war crimes that have been committed uh, in Afghanistan, we must talk first of political accountability. We must hold the Howard administration, the Rudd administration, the Gillard administration, the Turnbull administration and the Abbott administration responsible for continuing this deployment, this engagement, long after it was clear that there was no strategic objective that there no, was no victory that was possible and that our presence in Afghanistan was doing great harm to the people of Afghanistan and to those being asked to serve in that conflict. We must, from this moment, take it upon ourselves to answer the community's call to take the responsibility of the declaring war and entering into armed conflict into the hands of the parliament. It is clear that the executive cannot be trusted to make these decisions because they have so often led our armed forces into harm's way for no good reason. This process would enable, as I have outlined to the Senate in the bill that I have introduced, enable a process in which the Governor-General and the Prime Minister would make a case to the Parliament as to the, as to the legality, the duration and the number of personnel needed as part of a debate as to whether we should deploy into territory overseas and would require the Defence Minister to come before the Parliament every two months and update the Parliament as to the nature of the deployment. It would facilitate the community's ability to examine the case for conflict, for war, should there ever be one, and ensure that we are never again lied to never again lied to in relation to the reasons why we are entering into a conflict zone. Secondly, it is vital to understand that when we talk of these crimes that have been committed, that the chain of command must be held to account. The contention within the Brereton report that there exists a magical line above which no one in the armed forces chain of command knew about what was happening on the ground in Afghanistan is nonsense. It is offensive. It is absolutely untenable. Officers knew. The chain of command knew, and for the ADF's chain of command to come before the Australian public and contend that there existed a magical line above which nobody knew what was going on is ridiculous, above which the disciplinary measures will be determined between Chief of Army and Chief of the Defence Force.
is absolutely unacceptable. We cannot have a situation in which ops personnel on the ground are held to a different standard than those up the chain. And while we are on the subject of the unacceptable, it is absolutely not okay that those such as David McBride, who attempted again and again to flag his concerns through the proper channels only to be rebuked, is now facing 50 years of imprisonment at the hands of this government for attempting to tell the public that which we now know to be true. There must be accountability for the chain of command. And the implementation of the reforms suggested for the ADF must be overseen by those without a conflict of interest. And let me say it very clearly. General Campbell and General Burr have a real conflict of interest. They served in senior command positions during our time in Afghanistan. They are both former members of the SAS. The public, we owe it to the public and to the victims to ensure that these recommendations, this cultural brokenness that has been created within our special air services is dealt with by those without an interest in the matter. And that cannot be said of Generals Burr and Campbell, and that is why I repeat here tonight that for the good of this investigation, for the maintenance of public faith, they must resign. And if they do not resign, the Prime Minister must sack them. And lastly, in this debate, I want to bring it back to the reality that 39 families have lost loved ones that there are 39 families in Afghanistan right now that have lost loved ones to these crimes. That two other families that we know of now have members that are irreparably maimed by these crimes. No one, not the Prime Minister, not the Chief of the ADF, questions the content of the Brereton report as to the crimes uncovered. And so it should be possible for this place to join with the spirit of humility and of genuine sorrow and of a desire to make good for wrong done that exists in this community of ours, for this parliament to say sorry, to say sorry to those that have been lost to these crimes and to make that apology material by offering compensation to the families. Let us look clearly in the eye of what has happened here. Let us seize this opportunity to reckon with the reality that war is hell and when we enter into it without a clear reason for it, when we enable it to become distanced from political scrutiny, when we enable culture to develop among those who we ask to fight that dehumanises, then these crimes, these actions are inevitable. And let us pledge here to take those steps necessary to ensure that these things never happen again, that there is accountability of the chain of command, that there is justice for the families, and that we here in this place take the steps to secure peace, peace for our community here in Australia, for our region and for every human being on this blue planet. I thank the Chamber for its time. Thank you, Senator Stiljohn. Senator Abetz. We look out the front doors of Parliament House 
you cannot help but see the vision of the avenue and then ultimately the Australian War Memorial. And it is the men and women that have served this nation willing to give their lives that in fact allow us to celebrate and enjoy the democracy we have in Australia today. So those of us that participate in this debate need to acknowledge up front the service of the men and women who have been willing to lay down their lives for us so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have today. That surely, Madam Acting Deputy President, has to be the starting point in any debate, any concern in relation to our defence forces. Men and women of previous generations have protected us from invasion by dictatorships. They continue to do so. They continue to protect us. And when we have engaged in theatres of war around the world, it has been to protect not only us but also our friends and fellow human beings from the ugly hand of dictatorship. And so we have stood by friends in the support of freedom. Now, into that history in recent times has been brought this credible information that certain untoward activities may have occurred. Yet the mover of the motion continually asserted, falsely might I add, that crimes had been committed. That remains to be determined. If you want to rely on this report, you have to do so with integrity. You cannot pick and choose and say, on the one hand, all the generals up the chain of command have to take responsibility, and therefore I reject that part of the report. But the honourable senator in moving the motion has also rejected that part of the report, which says that it is credible information, but nothing has been proven. And one of the great civilising features of our society is that we actually believe in the rule of law, that we actually believe in the presumption of innocence, that we do rely on proof, that we do require evidence before we are willing to condemn people. And can I remind the honourable senator that because we are a civilised society, we do not believe in the lynch mob. We do not believe in the feral activities of people saying, I don't like this person and let's start condemning the person. Because we know how that ends up. Australia has just recently gone through a very shameful chapter in relation to Cardinal George Pell where the High Court of Australia, 7-0, came to the conclusion that an innocent man may well have been convicted. 7-0, the High Court. Yet hundreds of thousands of people uh, around this— Order, Senator Abet. Senator Steele-John. Nowhere in this motion is there a mention of Cardinal George Pell, and I would ask you to bring Senator Abetz to order on the issue of relevance. I am listening to Senator Abetz's contribution very carefully, Senator Steele-John, and um, I will draw his attention to the content of the motion. Thank you, Senator Abetz. I would have thought even the honourable senator would have understood the consequences of a lynch mob seeking to condemn a person without going through the proper judicial system of Order, proving things. Senator Abetz. And senator Wish Wilson. Point of order, Acting Deputy President. Um, senator Steeljom is not honourable because he hasn't been a minister. So I think Senator Abetz should just refer to him as Senator Steeljom. Uh, <laughs> I will um, take some of the interjections around the chamber. I, I thought that we were um, in the manner of referring to ourselves as honourable if we so wished. I will ask Senator Abetz to continue with his contribution. Thank you. Here we are, Madam Acting Deputy President, being told by the Australian Greens that this is an urgent matter. 
of matters of great urgency, of great principle, and yet we have the laughter and the stupidity of those sort of points of order indicating that the Australian Greens do not take this matter as seriously as they have asserted to do by moving a matter of urgency. But I go back to the point, Madam Acting Deputy President, that one of the great civilising features of our society is that we don't believe in the lynch mob, that we do believe in the rule of law, that we do believe that a person should only be convicted on the basis of evidence and not on the basis of mere assertions. And let's be very clear. The report on which—I'll delete the word honourable—the senator and I must say I feel more comfortable in just referring to him as a senator, says that there is credible information. As a result of credible information, you then go through the process of investigating to ascertain whether or not the credible information can be proven. And the report itself says that many of those things that they have found have not been put on a standard of proof, not even on the basis of the balance of probabilities, let alone beyond reasonable doubt. All they're asserting is that there is credible information. And so um, let's also be clear in this motion. We are being told that the military chain of command needs to be brought to account for their role. Well, what's the fi uh, what did the uh, inquiry find? And I quote: no, "Found no evidence that there was knowledge of or reckless indifference to the commission of war crimes on the part of commanders at troop, platoon, squadron, company, or task group headquarters level, let alone at higher levels such as commander, joint task force C, uh, CJTF 633, Joint Operations Command." or Australian Defence Headquarters, nor is the inquiry of the view that there was a failure at any of those levels to take reasonable and practical steps that would have prevented or detected the commission of war crimes. But yet here we have the Australian Greens, despite this finding, coming in demanding the resignation of certain people higher up in the Defence Forces. On what basis? on the basis of they know better than the inquiry. They know better than everybody else. According to the Australian Greens, these men should be required to resign from their positions. Why? Because the Greens say so. Not because of an inquiry finding anything. In fact, the inquiry found the exact opposite of that which the senator is referring and asserting to us and the nation Order, that these matters— Order, Senator Abetz. Senator uh, Stilljohn. Be as I am always to be verbaled by Senator Abetz, I made it clear in my contribution that I call for their resignation on the basis of real or perceived conflict of interest. I am unhappy about being verbaled like this by um, the senator. Senator Stilljohn, if you want to— if, that's a debating point, Senator Stilljohn. Um, yeah, you can do. You can seek to correct the point at the end of the debate if you wish to. But otherwise, I will ask Senator Betts to continue with his contribution. Thank you. You always know that you're making a solid contribution when the Greens raise frivolous points of order. This is now the third one. We'll see if they get another one in within the 10 minutes. But, uh, Madam Deputy President, we were told that crimes had been committed. We were told that the Gillard government is responsible as well. And of course, I am well reminded of the fact that the only reason we had the Gillard government was because the Australian Greens signed up with them. So if the Gillard government is responsible, let's deal with Senator Bob Brown accordingly as well, and let's see them scuttle away like cockroaches when you turn the light on. They will not want to be considered. And here order, we go, Senator spurious Abetz. point of order, order number four. Senator Abetz, Senator Wish Wilson. Not, not spurious at all, Acting Deputy President. I'd ask Senator, with, Senator to withdraw that. Uh, 
that imputation that was used by the Nazis repeatedly as propaganda. As propaganda, the use of cockroaches and shining of lights has been used by the Nazis, and the same totalitarian regimes that you referred to in your speech, Senator Abetz, and you know that, and you should withdraw that imputation. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Betts, if you could clarify your comments, that would be appreciated and uh, continue. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, Madam Deputy President, but there is no need to clarify a well known expression about cockroaches scuttling away when you turn the lights on. It is a common term of phrase uh, within the Australian parlance, and uh, I, I have never known it to have been associated as Senator Wish Wilson in his frivolous point of order seeks to assert. But let, let's be very clear. Did they deny in that point of order that the only reason the Gillard government was able to be in existence was because of Senator Bob Brown and the Australian Greens joining them to allow them to then commit those crimes of which Senator Steele John regaled the Senate? Because if we go right up the chain of command and demand that all the parliamentarians responsible be held responsible, it would mean that Senator Bob Brown would be responsible as well and would need to be dealt with. And of course, that is where, when you take the Greens' logic to its proper extent, you find that their arguments fall apart. They are internally inconsistent. All that said, what the government has sought to do and done ve do very responsibly is to ensure that these credible, uh, this credible information is dealt with in a proper manner through the rule of law, through the proper system that it be investigated, ascertained, and then we can determine whether or not men and women ought be charged and if so, with what charge and the consequences that flow. This is not for this chamber to determine. We have the rule of law in this country for a very good reason. We do seek to ensure that it's not parliamentarians that determine who gets charged or who gets convicted. That is for a separate arm of our government for the judicial system to determine. And what I simply say to Senator Steele, John, and others in this place is be very, very careful what you wish for, because one day, as you seek to use the parliament to condemn people, others in this parliament may then use it as well. A dangerous precedent which should be rejected. Thank you, Senator Abet. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The release of the report by the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force, Major General Burton, into allegations of war crimes committed by Australian Special Forces in Afghanistan is a difficult moment for the nation. <coughs> Findings in the report that credible information exists in relation to some members of Australia's Special Forces having engaged in unlawful killings and cruel treatment while deployed in Afghanistan are appalling. This report states that credible evidence exists that members of our most elite armed forces behaved unlawfully, unconscionably and committed war crimes as defined by the Australian criminal justice system. These allegations in respect of a few do not detract from the sacrifice of the many who have served our country, and in particular the thousands of current and former soldiers who served in Afghanistan. Major General Brereton has demonstrated the utmost integrity in handling this difficult task, and we thank him for his work. We also acknowledge the courageous leadership within the Australian Defence Force in ordering this investigation and now committing to the next steps. The report is distressing for many who have shown extraordinary bravery in speaking up about what they saw and knew was inappropriate conduct. Giving voice to their concerns would not have been easy. The report highlights that the protective culture insul insulating Special Forces soldiers was a key factor in creating an environment that allowed unlawful behaviour. The report also demonstrates that we should have faith in the Australian justice system. Where allegations of bad conduct are made, they are properly investigated and the findings acted upon. The confronting honesty of the report highlights that Australia is a country that respects the Geneva Conventions, human rights and the rule of law, and that no one is exempt from those laws. 
We support the establishment of the Office of the Special Investigator to oversee the investigations following this report. It is now appropriate that it is allowed to do its work free of any pre prejudice or political interference. Yesterday, the Senate agreed to a significant motion, moved together by the Leader of the Government in the Senate, the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate and the Minister for Defence, recognising the allegations of grave misconduct by some members of the Australian Special Forces community. The Senate, through this motion, also expressed its deep sympathy to the people of Afghanistan and the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan for the alleged misconduct and command failures identified by the inquiry, and noted the Chief of the Defence Force, on behalf of the Australian Defence Force, has also sincerely and unreservedly apologised to the people of Afghanistan for any wrongdoing by the Australian soldiers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, what I would like to do today, with this opportunity to speak, is to ask some questions. I want to precede that by saying that I don't know a lot about this topic, but I feel very strongly that we need to know more about it in this chamber and in parliament in itself. This, in some ways, refers to the trial, and Senator Kitching, Senator Betts has, have discussed that. I won't comment because I don't know the facts, and there is a trial underway. What I want to turn to, though, and ask questions about, is the source of the conflict, the root cause, because I think many people in this chamber will share these questions with me. What is the so source of the conflicts, the regional conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan? And more particularly, what is the source of our entry into those conflicts, participants? And I can vividly remember Mr Alexander Downer re retiring from parliament and saying on his ABC interview that one of the things he remembered, they were talking about various stories, and one of the things he said he remembered was that the Prime Minister at the time, John Howard, came back from America where we had the, uh, the Twin Towers, the 9-11 catastrophe. And he walked into the cabinet, I believe, and just said, we're off to Iraq. And that floored me. We're committing all these troops, changing their lives, changing the lives of people in other countries, with no, no debate. Just a, we're off to Iraq. No executive council meeting, no cabinet meeting, no parliamentary scrutiny or review. And I don't think that the parliament should have the power to declare war or to decide whether or not our troops are engaged overseas, but it needs to have some review. Governments need to be able to act quickly, but we must have some review regularly. So as I understand it, and I may be wrong on this, but that we never declared war in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan at its core is a civil war. It's a tribal nation. It's had conflict for hundreds of years. People have tried to take it over. The Americans have been in Afghanistan. The, Af the Russians have been in Afghanistan. People with far superior weapons. But no one has conquered Afghanistan. And it remains an unresolved conflict that is just sucking up lives. And remember that Australians weren't dealing with soldiers over there. They were dealing with terrorists, sometimes little boys and girls dressed up, wrapped in a bomb. People infiltrating our own armed forces, trainees that we were training from Afghanistan, infiltrating the, uh, the, the trainees' forces and shooting Australians and Americans in their training camps. This is not a conventional war. And we put young people from Australia in harm's way. Some died. And some have a far worse fate. They are suffering with the, the acts that they committed under extreme stress. And they will live with that. And it should be our duty, no matter what the findings of this trial, to help them to live with that. But I come back to the people who took us into Afghanistan, the head of this country. We were told we were going into Iraq because of weapons of mass destruction. There were none. And the people of the greatest democracy in terms of size, the most powerful nation on earth, the United States, were told the same lie and the Defence Secretary and the President and various Cabinet Ministers admitted later that there were no weapons of mass destruction, no evidence of such. And we admitted that here, our heads of state. 
Who will hold these people accountable? Who will hold the, the agencies accountable for briefing them? Because the ultimate responsibility for soldiers' actions are the values of the country and the leaders of the country, because the leaders are trustees for the values. But there is hope, because for the first time in many, many presidencies in the United States, we have a president in Donald Trump who has not started a war. My understanding is he is the first in many, many presidential terms. It's now the lefties, the Obamas, the Bidens, who want to drop bombs on behalf of globalists. It is now Trump who's withdrawing troops and has since, since he first got into the presidency. And the Trump is the first president to start a war and to engage in peacemaking efforts with South Korea. So I highlight the responsibility of the senior levels of our government and of our parliament and our joint, re joint responsibilities to fulfil them. Thank you. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, another day, another motion of urgency from the Greens where they have failed to look at the government's response to an issue before attacking it. Yesterday, the Greens moved a motion wanting the opportunity to increase the number of motions they can bring forward to this chamber. When they constantly use MPUs and MPIs to attack the government on issues where they clearly haven't looked at the facts, it is hard for this chamber to even consider uh, giving them. S Senator, uh, Senator Stilljohn, point of order. Thank you, Deputy Chair, point of order on relevance. Given the content of the motion, uh, Senator Van's contribution is not relevant. Uh, Senator Stilljohn, I believe that Senator Van has still just started his speech. So, um, Senator Van. Thank you kindly. Uh, so, it's hard for this chamber to even consider giving them more opportunities. This chamber has serious business to consider. We currently have more than 20 bills on the notice paper. The Greens are just here trying to interrupt, disrupt and frustrate the work which we do in this place. Yet again, the Greens have moved this motion of urgency, which is a clear Dorothy Dixit for us, because once again you've provided me with, they have provided me with a great opportunity to highlight the actions of the Morris government is taking. The actions that we're taking on this matter are methodical, clear, calm and appropriate. There is no doubt, Ms Acting Deputy President, the findings within the Brereton report were sad, distressing, concerning and require thorough action to be taken. The Morrison government, along with the Australian Defence Force, is taking action to meet not only our domestic and international obligations but also our moral obligation to ensure that this does not happen again. The findings of the Brereton report are amongst the most serious issue that any Prime Minister, Minister for Defence or any Chief of Defence Force has ever had to deal with in the history of our nation. Though the members of the crossbench who have decided to come in here and use this report for political point scoring need to realise that there is no quick fix for this. There are no easy answers. There is no one simple thing that will deal with the reasons behind these multiple allegations of war crimes. In contrast to the tokenism from those in the Greens, this government, along with the Chief of Defence Force, is getting on with the job. So let's talk about some of the facts about what this government is doing. On the 19th of November this year, CDF released a public version of the Afghanistan inquiry report delivered to him by the Inspector General of the ADF. The Chief of the Defence Force said the ADF is rightly held to account for allegations of great, grave misconduct by some members of the Australian Special Forces during operations in Afghanistan. The CDF, on behalf of the ADF, has sincerely and unreservedly apologised to the people of, of Afghanistan for any wrongdoing. Furthermore, he conveyed this message to his Afghan counterpart, General Zia. The CDF, in leading Defence's response to the inquiry report, e sorry, is leading the Defence's response to the inquiry report by developing an implementation plan. This implementation plan will undertake actioning of the Inspector General's recommendations 
<coughs> and any other <coughs> matters arising from the report. Once developed, this implementation plan will be provided to the government for consideration and response, as it should. To ensure the implementation plan is appropriate, our government has established the Afghanistan Inquiry Implementation Oversight Panel. This panel will comprise of three eminent, experienced and suitably qualified Australians and will provide oversight of Defence's response. This panel will be independent of Defence and will report back directly and regularly to the Minister for Defence. This response will ensure that the response from Defence is thoughtful, measured and appropriate. Mr Acting Deputy President, there is no denying that allegations contained in the inquiry report are deeply disturbing. They must be addressed and individually investigated, but they need to be addressed with a deep respect for justice and the rule of law. Fundamental to that is the presumption of innocence, the central tenet of our criminal legal system. Senator Waters coming in here calling on the government to bring individuals to justice is flying in the face of that tenet. We have to respect the rule of law. We have to protect the presumption of innocence. Throughout the report, the recommendation states that there is realistic prospect of a criminal investigation obtaining sufficient evidence to charge. And that's the whole point. We need to make sure that there is a criminal investigation that obtains that sufficient evidence before charges can be laid. We can't act as judge and jury in this place. And this is why the Morrison Liberal government is also establishing the office of the special investigator within the Home Affairs portfolio. The office will address the potential criminal matters identified in the inquiry report. In particular, this new office will investigate allegations, gather evidence and, where appropriate, refer briefs to the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions for their consideration. This is a considered, thorough and mature approach to dealing with these grave allegations. Any administrative, disciplinary, judicial or other proceedings arising as a result of the inquiry will be conducted according to the well-established processes of Australia's legal system. Processes which ensure individuals' rights to due process and a fair hearing. Accountability will be the cornerstone of Defence's response to the inquiry. Mr Acting Deputy President, the government of the day also has a duty of care to members of our Defence Force, something the Greens uh, seemingly pay scant regard to. Senator uh, Stilgeon. Uh, Acting Deputy Chair, I draw your attention to the State of the Chamber. Quorum required. Quorum required.
quorum has been achieved. Senator Van. Greens. Well, again, Mr Acting Deputy President, we see the Greens playing games in this place. We see them playing petty little child's games, and they're just making a mockery of this place, of the serious business that needs to do there. But back to my speech. We're committed to we, the Morrison Liberal government, is committed to ensuring that current and former serving ADF members are not impacted by the Afghanistan inquiry, them along with their families. They all have access to the right support at the right time. We're also focused on supporting those who are vulnerable or at risk. The Australian Defence Force is the finest military in the world. The inquiry report should not cast a shadow over the vast majority of our Defence Force members who served in Afghanistan with distinction. This year, we have seen the best of our Defence Force right here at home. Through operations such as bushfire assists and their support to states and territories during the COVID pandemic, every day this year we have seen images of our Defence Force personnel helping everyday Australians through what has been the hardest year that I can certainly remember. While depressing, unedifying and completely regrettable, the allegations outlined in the Brereton report do not reflect the service of our Defence Force service men and women. Mr Acting Deputy President, it is clear that there is no quick fix. There are no easy answers. And it is incredibly disappointing, Mr Acting Deputy President, that Senator Waters and her Greens colleagues at that end of the chamber just want to play games and score political points with this very important matter and waste the time of the Senate. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to this matter of urgency. What happened in Afghanistan was the murder and torture of innocent people, even children, it happened. which left families torn apart and communities in ruin. These heinous war crimes committed by Australia are another shameful chapter in our history. We demand justice for the victims. And this government should be ashamed standing there and shouting back at us and saying that these crimes didn't happen. The perpetrators of these crimes and their superiors must be held to account and must face the full force of the law. Justice must be served here. All in investigations must be independent and the findings have to be made public and there must be fair compensation and reparations for the families and to the communities targeted by these disgusting crimes. The government must apologise to those families. Australian soldiers must be brought home. In stories like that of Afghanistan, in stories like that of Australian soldiers drinking beer out of a dead Taliban fighter's prosthetic leg, we see the culture that allowed this brutality to go on. We shouldn't just oppose war crimes, though. We should reject the militarism and the nationalism that encourages them. World over, we see the horrifying human cost when unfettered militarism and nationalism fuels and permits state violence. In Palestine, the occupying forces have committed untold human rights abuses with impunity and the support of those who deny the Palestinian people self-determination and the right of return. In Kashmir, the military continues to enforce a cruel lockdown, denies Kashmiris access to internet and other essentials, and is responsible for arbitrary detentions. In Xinjiang, a vast military apparatus sustains the oppression and cultural genocide of Uyghurs, separating families, detaining hundreds of thousands, and subjecting many to cruelties like forced sterilization. Just as all violence and war must be condemned and avoided, the politicians who take us to wars must be condemned and held to account. The post-9-11 wars on terror have raged for 20 years now. These wars have killed half a million civilians in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan. 
Women have been the often unseen victims of this war, their rights violated while they face gender-based violence. Afghans have been forced to flee their own country. They are now one of the largest refugee populations in the world. We must admit that deploying armed forces, guns, bombs, in the name of quashing terrorism will not protect anyone. It has the exact opposite effect. We must stop warmongering and blindly following the US. Where war is concerned, history has sadly repeated itself time and again. The incessant self-interested attempts of the West to control and extinguish complex Middle Eastern conflicts must end. And we must not forget the root cause of these conflicts stems from similar Western interventions in the first place. We need to clearly imagine what we want for the world. That means changing the conversation from going to war to bringing peace and justice. If that is what we aim for, then our success will rest on reparations for past injustices, fair economic, environmental and social development, and respect for human rights, not on military capabilities. I do want to acknowledge the courage of whistleblowers like David McBride and journalists here and in Afghanistan who put their necks and indeed their lives on the line to get the truth out in the open. They must be protected. Australians have been shocked by the inhumanity of the heinous war crimes exposed by the Brereton Report. Now is the time to bring people together to send a strong message to our government. War criminals must be charged. Soldiers must be brought home. Reparations must be given. War is never the answer. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Prima facie, what we heard from the Burton Report clearly signalled war crimes, criminality and gross human rights violations. Prima facie. It is true that there's been no prosecutions. We don't know what charges will be laid when that will happen, but prima facie what we have heard uh, is very concerning and has deeply shocked the Australian people. Um, I did say in here the other day at question time, and I, and I meant it, um, I don't think uh, any cohort of Australians probably would have been more shocked than many serving members of the ADF and, and the veterans community. Um, I spoke, spoke to my own father, who's a Vietnam vet, about this, and uh, I think we need to be uh, very clear here that when we're speaking uh, about our defence services, we need to be open and honest about this situation, because it, if we don't clear it up, then, of course, by logic, everyone's going to be tarred with this brush in the defence forces. If we brush it under the carpet and pretend it's going to go away and look over there, it's never going to go away. And that taint is always going to remain. The best thing to do is to be open and transparent and deal with this expediently and independently. And this is the point that I would like to raise about whistleblowers. We only got the Burton report released because of a whistleblower, David McBride, uh, an ex-army major who worked with special forces. He had significant concerns about the conduct of the war. He's been very public about that, uh, including uh, senior officers and, and other non-commissioned officers acting with impunity. He raised his concerns internally for two years, and they weren't dealt with. He went to the Australian Federal Police. It wasn't dealt with. And out of desperation, he went to the media. He's a whistleblower. Now, we know the ABC officers were raided. Uh, by the Australian Federal Police upon publication of information that was passed on by McBride. Uh, thankfully, the government's decided, the Attorney General's decided not to prosecute the media in this instance or the publishers. However, this government in this Senate last week refused to rule out the prosecution of a veteran who's had two tours of Afghanistan, who has blown the whistle and delivered us a report on prima facie Australian war crimes in Afghanistan. Whether we like it or not, whether it troubles us and keeps us awake at night, a whistleblower has delivered this. So why is that court case going ahead? Why is David McBride facing 50 years in jail? Now, 
Let me tell you this. The Burton report said not only should whistleblowers be protected to encourage an ex expeditious uh, process around getting to the bottom of this, but they should be applauded and promoted. That's come directly from the Burton report. So why is the person that disclosed this and got this into the public realm facing jail? And I have to put that question, Acting Deputy President, because it seems to be part of a political strategy by this government to go after whistleblowers who embarrass them. It's not just David McBride. It's also Bernard Caleri, the lawyer for Witness K and Witness K, who also exposed uh, criminality by our intelligence agencies and our government in relation to one of our neighbours, a lot poorer country than us, Timor-Leste. And the complicity, the silence of this government on the extradition of a Walkley Award-winning journalist, Julian Assange, to the country whose war crimes he exposed. We think about McBride and the Afghan report and how that shocked the Australian people. Well, WikiLeaks exposed identical war crimes, or worse, by our allied forces in Afghanistan and Iraq. And there was no doubting what he exposed. It was 100 per cent factual. And it was published all around the world by key media outlets. Yet this Australian publisher, this whistleblower, and Chelsea Manning in the US, in jail behind bars, is facing 175 years uh, in a process that's never been seen before, where a foreign citizen is being extradited to the US on espionage charges. This is also something that we need to deal with when we think about Afghanistan. Free Julian Assange and bring him back to Australia. The question is that the motion put by Senator Steeljohn be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the eyes have it. The nose have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Oh, you're going to be.
stop the bells. So the question is that the motion put by Senator Stilljohn be agreed to. Those of that opinion move to the right of the chair. Those against move to the left of the chair. And I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the eyes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the nose. Yeah, I'll be The result of the division is nine ayes and 38 noes, which means the motion has been negated.